So, welcome everybody. Um, today's talk is by Jonas Hirsch from the University of Leipzig. Uh, and he will talk about the regularity of area minimizing currents mod P. Please take it away. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. And it's a pleasure to talk. Um, I would ask you that you please ask questions as soon as they arise, because otherwise, perhaps, I mean, not to postpone all to the end. Um, so I'm going to talk about an ongoing project with Camilo Delelis, Andrea Marquez, and Salvatore Stewart. And it's on the regularity of area minimizing currents mod P. So my plan for this talk is to give you a very, very fast introduction to what um, area minimizing currents mod P are and why they are not interesting. And then what we actually did and what are the difficulties you face if you go from area minimizing currents to area minimizing currents mod P. So what, what it changes to do this mod P. So let me start. Um, so this is really short and I hope um, it's nonetheless enough that you can kind of follow the ideas behind this. So what we actually um, look are, are rectifiable integer rectifiable currents. So, and I denote them by this RM. So that a, little m is the dimension um, of the current and are, they are currents in RM plus n. And you should think of them in the following way. So you have a M rectifiable set. On that you have a measurable function. So it's measurable on that set. And it takes values in Z. And you have given an orientation and the orientation is the orientation of the tangent plane that exists almost everywhere to that M rectifiable set. So one very particular notion would be if this sigma here is just a smooth M dimensional manifold. And the nice thing is what you can do with such an object, you plug in an M form, which is smooth, And what you can do is you can actually integrate over it, over it. So there was a mistake, there should be a sigma. So you integrate over this rectifiable set, which has locally finite uh, measure. You integrate the density and you plug in into this form um, the orientation. So this one, this object here will give you a real number. And so this object here is well defined. And that is what you should have in mind for an M rectifiable current. Okay, natural by this one, you can get actually define a boundary. And this boundary is the, the object what you normally think if you want to solve the plateau problem, which is your boundary data. Okay, so how does it act on this object is you by duality, you just let it act on the form itself, which now makes sense. Now again, there is a mistake. There should be twice sigma and there is as well sigma. So you integrate an M minus one form. So if you take D of an M minus one form, you get back an M form. So this one is M minus one form. So this one will be an M form. And so you're back that you can apply the, pre the previous formula and you have a notion of an M minus one dimensional object, which is the boundary. And if you choose this rectifiable set in a coherent way, you find the mass and the mass is just integrating the absolute value of this, um, of the rectifiable set. So there's a subclass of these rectifiable currents, which play an important role in solving the plateau problem, which are the integral currents. And the integral currents are these subset of the rectifiable ones such that the boundary itself is a rectifiable set. So you can represent the boundary in the similar way as you can do it with um, the rectifiable set itself. 
This was kind of the breakthrough approach by Federer and Fleming to solve the plateau problem because they were able to show that if you, fit, if you have a sequence that has bounded, is bounded in mass and has bounded mass of the boundary of integer rectifiable currents, then you actually get a limit which is itself rectifiable, which is not totally obvious. I mean, by this one, by this approach, it's kind of clear that currents live in the dual space of the smooth M forms and by that one you directly find a weak limit, but it's not clear that the limit itself can be represented in that way. Uh, still as a rectifiable current, but this was kind of um, solved in, um, in the 70s. Now there's one subclass which makes things a little bit larger and which are the flat currents, um, the flat chains actually. And you should think of them, it's like the closure of the rectifiable currents under the flat norm. I will say something in a second about the flat norm because it plays an important role for the currents mod P. So, okay. And let me go to the flat norm. So the flat norm is between two currents is defined to be what? You take the decomposition of the distance into two parts and you're allowed kind of to go to one um, current, which is one dimension higher. So you want to represent it by something of the same dimension and something as a boundary of an M plus one dimensional thing. So this one is again M dimensional. So why does it make sense? Assume you have two, two one dimensional currents, which are now integers, so two lines you can think of and you would like to measure the distance. So if you would take the mass, it would be kind of, they would be quite large because it would be the length of T plus the length of S because they have this joint support, which is kind of not good. But if you look at the um, flat distance, what you can do is you can connect them. So, um, oh, yes. So now we add these pieces. Uh, now I should do wait this one and kind of this one. Now it, it looks a bit weird that you can make it in, in the coherent way, but um, if you look at really the surface inside, then you can now find a filling in here. So you can find a filling in here, which is then telling you that they are not far away from each other, which would be then this Z and the, the other one is the R. Okay, so now if you want to go to currents mod P is we don't, I mean, heuristically is what you do is you are not taking now values in Z, but you take it in the um, cyclic group Z P, so Z mod P. And to do this formally, you to go to that quotient group is what you do is you introduce the flat P distance. And instead of only allowing kind of a de decomposition in two pieces, you allow now three pieces. So you are allowed to add as well a, a current, again, of the multiplicity of the currents itself. So the M dimensional ones, but this must come with a multiplicity P. So it's always kind of P times and therefore it kind of is not seen by the current itself. So to make an example, I was thinking, think of this current. So T should be a plus. Um, ah, sorry, now I found the, mis the mistake um, I was doing in the drawing here. And to clarify things is because, I mean, it's true that we have T minus S. So since there is a minus, you reverse the orientation in here. So you get this orientation and now you can make out of it a loop and then you can make the filling. So it was correct what I did here. Now in here, I wanted to have actually them with a minus to be coherent. So if I subtract T plus S, what I get is a plus and a plus. So this is all the three pluses are now my current T minus S. And now, I, I mean, if I would classically consider the flat distance, there's no way to put there a nice way of lines. But if I go to mod three, 
what I can do is I can add one point and now I can just link them all together. So now you see that this point in the center comes with multiplicity three and therefore it doesn't count. And what you get is actually that the flat norm of T minus S classically would be three. But if you calculate the mod three, one, what you, you get, this one doesn't count because it's the center point doesn't count because it comes with multiplicity three. So what only counts are the half lines and they have, let's say, if they sit on the unit circle, you have one half. So what you get is three halves. And you see that the flat P norm is smaller. Now what you define to go to the quotient space is um, you say two currents are the same if their flat, flat P distance is zero. So in theory, just to give two examples is what you could do if, if you see one line, this, the black one should be my current T. And what I could kind of add is just here, one loop with multiplicity three. And so it doesn't matter. So actually there's a huge difference between even and odd numbers where you do the flat distance, because if you look at even numbers, something kind of um, artificially can happen is you take the same line, but you reverse the orientation. So you go, let's say forward on that piece, then you reverse the orientation and then you go, I mean, backwards a little piece and then you go forward again. So here you have plus minus plus. And this makes the analysis later on quite hard for even, even P. Okay, now by this introduction, what you actually get is that you have now a same class, so you get all the same objects with now a P. So you have rectifiable currents mod P, inter integral rectifiable currents mod P, and the flat chains mod P, and they are defined in all the same way, but you always take the quotient by this um, equivalence of this definition. Okay, now, as you do for the classically plateau problem, you can now ask the plateau problem for this class, new class of currents mod P. So, and we say, okay, a current T in the very same way is minimizing mod P. If, if you compare it with any other boundary, then it has less mass. So this object is nothing else than saying it's, a, it's a, another current such that T and T prime, so you could as well phrase it, let me write it below. So you could as well say, this is the same as T prime for all T prime in the same dimension such that the boundary of T minus T prime is equal to zero if I consider it in the class mod P. One, one interesting consequence um, actually of this object is that automatically, let me don't prove it, is that you get an upper bound on the density that appears inside your rectifiable set, what you actually get, oops, no, I got too far, is that theta of x in absolute value is actually less or equal than p half almost everywhere. Which is a contrast to the classical situation if you only look at minimizing currents. So why is this, for instance, interesting? So one interesting case would be just the simple example. Again, go back to this, what we had before, the three points. This should be our boundary. And now classically, you would not even see that the boundary, that this is a boundary because three pluses are not zero. And to be the boundary of something, you need to be boundary. At, I mean, the boundary of the boundary must be zero. So 
this object would not be a boundary in the classical sense, but mod 3 the, it is. And the minimizer actually would be the Steiner connection. So it would be this object. Uh, reverse, sorry. Wrong direction of the arrows. Okay. Now, nonetheless, I mean, you could say this looks all a little bit artificial, but actually it makes a difference because it might be interesting um, if you think of real soap films. So assume you look at the situation of taking two circles and put them in soap and then you pull them out. So you will find several possibilities. So you know there's one, the most classical one would be probably the catenoid. So the catenoid looks something like this. This would be the filling. But now if you check what is the boundary curve, you would see, okay, if I go along the same way as I did for the um, drawn pieces, then this one goes the same. But now you see if you follow um, the, the orientation of your catenoid that the um, circle line on the top must be in the reverse order. So actually, you cannot, in the sense of current, you cannot put in into this boundary configuration the catenoidal neck, which you actually find in soap films. And therefore, you might argue that even the current mod P are not the correct object to look at, but at least they are. So classically, there's actually more or less only one way to fill this object. And the only possibility would be to do the filling in here. So you have two, two disks that sit on each other. So if you go to mod three, you still have the possibility of the, I was drawing here. So with the two floating disks, but actually now mod three, you can do something more. You can put in, artificially here put in a new circle that one we orient in the same way and now we can connect them with catenoidal necks uh, sorry i wanted to re remove it uh, reverse it in here so now it's okay because now this line comes with a multiplicity three what i want to say is you have one piece, which is this catenoid on top. You have the catenoid on the bottom. And then you have like a floating disc in the middle. And actually what you find in experiments is this, this object really appears that you have put, if you put these two, two circles in um, soap and pull it up, then you will find this floating disc. And um, there is, this is actually the minimizer mod three if you have these two disks sufficiently close together. So if you are too far apart, then actually the two disks are better, but it's either this one or that one. And you can show that there is an equivalent notion of these symmetric situation for every P and every dimension. I mean, kind of the analog analogous of this floating disk you find in every dimension. So it's not true. I mean, it's kind of a natural generalization of these, let's say, polyhedral um, singularity structures you see here to higher dimension and higher p. Another perhaps motivation is if you want to go to unoriented surfaces. So let me think. Um, let me shortly look again as an example, which is the Möbius strip. So if we take this one as a boundary curve, it's a closed connected curve. So by the classical theorem of Federer and Fleming, there must be a minimizing current sitting inside. And to do this, you have more or less only one option. And this option is kind of, you must fill it like, like two disks that sit on each other. I mean, it's hard to draw how they are twisted in here because it's not intersecting, but you can think of it's like a double disc and then it's turned around itself a little bit like this. Now, if you go to um, the 
mod two um, situation, what you actually can do is you can artificially um, put in a, an additional boundary which you just move twice. If you move this piece twice, it doesn't appear, it's not seen by the boundary, and then you can find a new filling. So what you now walk is this way, you walk here, then you walk up, then you walk backwards. Uh, did I do it now correctly? Wait, sorry, I always get confused. Um, now I should come up. I am not coming up. Yeah, no, it's correct. So, so I go up, now I come here the second time in, in the same direction. So now here's the second time, number two. So it cancels out and I co can close it up. And therefore there's the possibility to fill this object just around how you see the Möbius strip. And this is now a possible competitor in the class mod. Okay, and actually the physicists did some experiments and it really happens that way, that you can even go from one to the other if you do it in a smooth, sufficient way. So in soap bubbles, you find those. So this is, this is the situation. I mean, now it's unfortunately in the crossway. So this one should be this picture and this is the mobile strip on the other one. All right, so let me go back here to the definition. So what we are actually interested in is uh, what I was saying is the regularity theorem. We would like to show that even if we go to that mod three, mod two situation, then everything, uh, okay, on a, on a large set, everything should be nice and smooth in a, a nice smooth surface. Okay, now what, what do we consider to be a good point? A good point is a point where we really look like a smooth manifold. And you should think of it in the following way. Okay, uh, sorry, I should say this before, um, is we from now on only look at the set which is not the boundary. So we go away from the boundary. But here you really need to think of the support of the boundary mod P because classically, all these artificially lines that you see here are boundaries of the current if you calculate the current the boundary in the in the classical sense so in the sense i was introducing here so this this line would be seen by this boundary but if you then take the the flat distance of the object it disappears all right now we say a point is a good point. So this is P, this should be a regular point if we find a ball around it, so an open set, and a smooth m-dimensional manifold, m, at least C1, but later on you will see it must be smooth because it solves the minimal surface equation. So at C1 manifold such that my current sits inside. So if I look inside this set, then the support of the current should be here. So it's really inside the manifold. Then actually, then by the closure theorem, which is an abstract um, theorem that holds as well for the current mod P is actually that T is uh, T restricted to U is actually a multiple of the manifold. For some theta and theta is now a constant and it lies between, let's say the open bracket from minus P half up to P half whoa, sorry, intersected with Z. Okay, so this is the definition of the regular points. What we found out is at the regular point, the manifold, I mean, our current is kind of supported in the smooth manifold and therefore it agrees with the manifold up to a multiple. 
Okay, so by definition, this set must be open, and now you're interested in the closure. You so you take away the, from the support of the current the regular set, which is open, and the support of the boundary. So you get a relative uh, OM closed set away from the boundary. So the theorem we were able to prove is actually that if you have a um, a current that is minimizing mod p then the singular set has Hausdorff dimension m minus one. If you think of it, this looks kind of optimal because, or it, it is optimal because these lines are obviously singular sets, right? I mean, even more easier if you, if you go to that with the three points, this one must be a singular point because you cannot find an open neighborhood such that it the current is supported in a nice smooth line. So these points are always points that are in the singular set of the current. Also, you might think, okay, but they still have a nice structure. I mean, here it's a nice circle. Here it would be just a line. Yes. So um, before I discuss how we approach the theorem, um, let me just shortly um, say what was known before we started our project. So if you go to one dimensional objects, then it does not really ma matter which P you look at and the singular set becomes discrete. Actually, it's not, not there if you go to P equal to two because P equal to two means you have one in-going line and one outgoing line or it's another ingoing line and then you can just reverse orientation and you're in the classical situation. So if you go to um, arbitrary m, so the, the dimension should be arbitrary, the co-dimension as well, and any p, then you know at least that the singular set is relative closed and meager, which is a direct consequence of Allard's theorem because T itself must be a stationary varifold, and then you can apply a lot. Okay, now a more precise statement is if you go to P equal to two, and there you have directly bound, so you have actually, Federer was able to prove that the H, uh, it's M minus two dimensional, and it was by the new work of um, neighbor Valtorter, you can improve this, not only to have um, the right dimension, but actually locally finite house of measure. So why does it happen? In some how you can think of it again from a point, I mean, a modern proof would be to use a large theorem because P equal to two will tell you that at almost every point you find a flat plane with multiplicity one, and then you're in the setting of a large. Now, more interesting is if it, I mean, more things were known if you go to co-dimension one. And okay, for P equal to two, it's just that now the regularity of co-dimension one kicks in and you can improve the M minus two dimensional object to M minus seven by the work of a neighbor Valtorta actually to locally finite M minus seven measure. So there was a complete description for one tuple which is two-dimensional and p equal to three and it's actually telling you okay this comes in a second i will discuss in a second okay then there are two exceptional things or let's say not really exceptional but for p odd um white was able to show that you can go back to the classical situation and that for all, at almost every point or at, on an open set, actually, you find that the singular set is not there because you can reduce it to classically minimizing currents and therefore you get something like M minus one dimensional. Okay, for P odd, which is what we are seeing kind of optimal and for P um, equal to four, you can use a very specific uh, clever trick to see an algebraic set because p equal to four is telling you you 
almost everywhere see kind of only two pieces which needs to cancel out to each other and then by that one you can again reduce it to the classical case and by that he was able to show that you are an immersed submanifold outside a closed set of zero hm minus two measure okay now let me go to that situation of taylor and the two floating this we were seeing before and this is actually the project we are trying now to find out is now the nice thing is okay m minus that it's m minus one dimensional is kind of optimal because what we found last time is that there is one possible configuration which is minimal which is this floating disc so you have these pieces with the cardanoidal neck and the filling in between and now the singular set is precisely this line. And Gene Taylor's result was telling you that sing T is actually a C1 alpha curve. And now this would be a nice thing to show that actually this holds true in full generality. We are not at the able at the moment able to derive this as a C1 alpha curve, but at the moment we are able to show is that if you go to the singular set where the density is actually p hat, also less strictly less than p hat, then you actually get that the Hausdorff measure is m minus two plus alpha. And this would be for Jean Taylor's result, all these pieces here in, in for her situation, they are then not there any, at all. And as a consequence is that for P odd, we actually get this, the singular set is M minus one rectifiable and has locally finite HM minus one measure. But this is a consequence of the stratification theory of neighbor while torture. So you see, there seems to be a quite a difference between P even and P odd. And the, the difference is really that flat planes um, can have for P even kind of the multiplicity P half. And for P odd, this is not possible. So kind of by this observation, what happens is that if you find a flat tangent space, a tangent cone, then it must be, I mean, the singular set can, in a neighborhood of this um, flat tangent space, only be of dimension m minus two for p odd. But for p even, this is not known. Okay, so what is the general um, strategy of the proof? The strategy of the proof is kind of the following the ideas of Almgren. And it's a proof by contradiction. And what we did, we kind of tried to follow his step and adapt them to that new situation. So the contradiction sequence is assuming that either this one fails or for the general setting for P, even this one fails. So by a good contradicting sequence is telling you the first thing you do is you reduce it by a stratification to a flat situation. Meaning that the tangent cone is flat. So you're very close to a plane and this plane has either multiplicity Q, P half. Well, this is not what I wanted to do. So it has either multiplicity P half is P could be even, or it has a multiplicity Q and Q is less than P half. So if it's P half precisely, then you, we want to show that the singular set has at most house of dimension M minus one. If it's less than P half, then it's M minus two. And it should be kind of of high density of the singular set.
meaning that you can kind of say, okay, the HM minus two plus alpha measure the density in zero uh, in infinity uh, M minus two plus alpha that this one is bigger than zero. So if you blow up on each scale, you see kind of the single set of the same size. Now, the second step is you would like to go to um, a local approximation. You, you don't want to argue on the nonlinear setting. You want to go to the linearized situation. And by passing to that um, difference, you need to um, do a local approximation. And about this step, I would like to talk in a second a little bit more precisely. Um, and it's in, in, in somehow it goes back to the idea of the Georgie. Then you want to show, you will see in a second, um, the result for the linear theory. So you, you get by the local approximation, you get something like a linear theory. And now you want to show that for the linear theory, these bounds hold. So either you find something which corresponds to Q less than P half, and then you want to show that the singular set of these linearized situation is of at most M minus two. But by this one, it should be bigger than M minus two, which then hopefully will lead to the contradiction. And for Q equal to P half, if P is even, you should show it's M minus one. So you replace the M minus two here by an M minus one. Okay, you could say, okay, this is a kind of independent step. It's unrelated to step one, two, and four. And then the very hard part, another hard part is you could say it's pa the passage from the linear, uh, from the nonlinear situation to the linear or vice versa. It depends where you, from which side you look at. And in here, the key word is um, Einbrenn center manifold. And the reason why you need to do this is because the singular structure could be of higher order than something where you are, I mean, you know already that you're very close to a singular, um, singular, uh, sorry, to a plane. And now you could think of, okay, there's a graph, which is still very nice and it's almost solving the, um, uh, minimal graph equation and which comes with multiplicity precisely p half and on that top again you you find first the branching order or the singular the sing the, the real singularity and now you need to subtract this middle sheet and this is kind of done by Eingren center manifold and it's a quite um, deep algorithm which then allows you to pass from this one to that one by a kind of unique continuation argument. Now, I would like to say something about this precise local approximation and the linear theory, because kind of you could say step one and step four worked already very well in I'm Grant's big regularity paper. And we could kind of in at least in these two pieces follow him in, in a kind of very close way only in here we needed i mean not only but in here we needed to come up with something new now let me first something to this um local approximation so what what is the local approximation you have so first um the de georgi situation So let us assume that T is almost a Lipschitz graph. So which is now um, not mod P. Okay, now it being almost a Lipschitz graph means I have my inner cylinder, I have my plane which is M dimensional and then on top, let's say we go to co-dimension one. Uh, 
and I wanted to do this. So oh, it was a bad drawing. So I have my cylinder where I'm interested in to look all the things. And then in here I have my, my T, which is the Lipschitz graph. So it's G of F, it's the graph of a function F. So if I now look at the area of this object, so the mass of T in that cylinder, then this is the integral over the one ball of the, of the Jacobian of F. Now, what is the Jacobian of F in co-dimension one? It's the gradient of F squared and the square root of it. So and now if you do the expansion, so this is something like the mass of P1, and then you have something like one half of the Dirichlet energy, and then you have higher order terms. And now you say, okay, if I'm minimizing this object, it should behave like almost like minimizing this object because this one is just a constant. Now this, and if I minimize such an object here, it should be like a, behaving like a harmonic function. And as we all know from PDE1 is harmonic functions are kind of smooth. So I expect that everything inside here is very nice and smooth. So this was actually the way um, almost um, the Georgi proved the regularity theorem in co-dimension one for um, sets of finite parameter. Now I'm going to apply the very same strategy for higher co-dimensions, but what changes is that you don't see here one function, but you might find several functions. And then you go to a generalized Dirichlet energy where you have now something like F1, F2, F3, but you kind of, you don't know if they connect to each other inside or how they are ordered. So you're not allowed to kind of apply the same machinery as you did for harmonic functions in here. And you really need to work with a new problem. Okay, now we would like, we wanted to do something very similar. So we wanted to approximate our function, our, our object by such a multi-valued functions. We knew it must be multi-valued because we can have branching, but now we needed to adapt it to this new situation where we could have the change of the um, orientation as I was kind of having in here. So you could, for P odd, jump between pluses and minus, and you don't know where it happens. Now you might think, okay, is this something artificial or can it really appear? And for that, I would like to kind of comment very shortly on that problem that it really appears. So let us look at the situation mod four that is completely understood by that theorem of white. So there we actually know that the singular set is not really there, there because you're kind of a union of immersed surfaces. So let us take something like this and what we take is the Anapper surface and the plane. So Anapper should be, th is this piece. And what is hardly seen is the gray piece, which should be kind of this, this square here, which is the plane. Now, if I see this one as a current mod, uh, mod four, actually the real situation would be, I take this line in the middle and I disconnect my, my, my square where everything is parameterized above to be in, inside on the right side, um, I call it plus. So there I take the classical um, orientation that comes from the graph. So I see this one, I mean, this piece of a napper really as, a, as which goes below here, which you cannot see, but below the, um, the square of the plane as oriented by the graph of the function. Same for the plane on, on the other side, I take it with a minus. So I get tier two regions. One region is this piece on that side, which is omega plus, 
And then I have one, the other part, which is this side, which is omega minus, where everything is kind of of reverse order. Okay, now what I still can do, which is kind of the same as you did um, for classical currents, you start slicing. And over each of these slices, you find now two points. Either in here, it would be the one of an effort and the one of um, the plane. So here you would have plus plus. And if you slice on that side, you find actually two and then now with a minus and a minus. Okay, and if you check is that the line in the middle, I was drawing it the purple, was that this one would now come depending weight let me think so this one is going here so it should be in this orientation and it comes with multiplicity force so it's cancelling out and as a current mod 4 it's not seen so by actually the real theory of um why this is actually the minim is a minimizer for the given boundary data and what we do is actually we we are able to decompose T roughly as the sum in this situation of two pieces, which are unoriented. So it's an Fi of X. So you have over each point, you see, uh, so sorry, I should write this one as a graph. Sorry, what's the boundary data here? The boundary data here is, uh, Okay, it's this one, this line, going now, let me think, it goes down. And then, okay, this was now a stupidly chosen color. Let me choose another one, then you can perhaps, okay, it's this one, in that situation, in this direction, plus, the box of the square as well in this situation. And then in the very same way you have outgoing in here, the opposite one. So it's this one plus this one. Now this one, now the next piece I cannot draw because it goes below us plus perhaps I can make it like this. And okay. it's okay because we're in this in this um, current setting that that you have an intersection of the curves. Yes, in this situation you have two curves. I mean, if you draw it like this, it would be kind of this. Uh, okay, now I changed colors. Let me try to do it. So you have this one plus this one. And then you have on that side, this one and this one. Yeah, yes, yeah, sorry. What I meant was um, that there's, uh, this is like a singular curve. It has this self intersection, right? I mean, it's the union of two smooth curves. Okay. Okay. Okay, thanks. But I mean, this is only to make, I mean, I'm okay. It's a bit complicated. What you might say is, okay, this seems to be a weird situation. I, I still would like to look at situation where the boundary curve is not intersecting and smooth. Right. And I agree with you that in this situation, you might hope that the singular structure is not going up to the boundary. What I want to show only is, I don't know how this piece appears inside the current. I'm not saying this is the full current. I'm only looking at the local picture. And then you do not really know how the boundary data looks like. Because what you are referring to would be a global topological problem. And this is the local regularity problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thanks. No problem. Thanks for the question. So what I wanted to say is you would define a multi-valued function and it is composed 
out of two values and then an orientation which is either plus or minus. And then T is the graph of the function f. Okay. Now you might say, okay, but why do I artificially um, introduce this object with the orientation on, on the plus and the minus? Because I mean, you, you know already that you can write this one as two graphs. But if you see it from a point of a current, you would, what you actually then would do is if, they, if you say they are the same, which is kind of reversing the orientation on that piece and that piece, that you can find a new competitor. And this new competitor actually would just be the harmonic extension of that line. And the harmonic extension of the other one. And now this will actually be totally disconnected, right? You will find harmonic extension, which kind of B is this one and the one on the bottom, which is this one. But these are not competitors for the orientation of the boundary data you are given. So the linear theory for this object is not the one that gives the right notion of competitors. So it's not true that if you minimize here the, the Dirichlet energy in the old Algren sense, which would find this one, to get the right comparison object. And so what we did is we um, created the linear theory for these special uh, multi-valued function. And then we're able to show that for the special valued function, actually the Hausdorff dimension is m minus one. Uh, sorry, here it's an m minus one and not an m minus two. And then for q not in the critical um, case, so for q unequal to p half, um, you can kind of go back to the old Almgren setting with a little bit of work, not a priori, but a posteriori, and show therefore that the singular set has measure m minus two, because you can approximate it by something that is not, I mean, has kind of here a fixed orientation. And so it's not switching between plus and minus. Okay, now going back to kind of the question that was just asked is, you would actually like to get the same rectifiability of the singular set for p even, which is not, not really the one I was referring to, but the fine structure of the singular set. So you would like to show that even for p on, for p odd in general, even in co-dimension one, that the singular set is like a C1 alpha, not necessarily now a curve, but a C1 alpha manifold. And then you can really ask questions like, do I have a singular set at all if the boundary curve is, let's say, a smooth connected piece? But these are kind of um, later questions you can address if you first get the local regularity theory for the singular set. And that are, yes, I would say work in progress. Where is the situation for the rectifiability of the singular set for P even? Um, seems to be a lot harder because you can always have these switching situations and you would need to show that even if you have these switching situation, then the current should behave nicely and you have not a very high order of the singularity, uh, singular set, which is not kind of seen on, on the first linearization. Okay, so um, this is what I wanted to say. And if I see, uh, look on the clock, I'm already over time, I guess. Sorry, All right.